Congressman Roskam, thank you so much for speaking with Voice of America. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you today. North Korea just conducted its sixth nuclear test on September 3rd. As the co-chair of Congressional Caucus on Korea, what is your reaction to this test? Well, the reaction is very harsh. Unfortunately, this has been foreshadowed by the language and the provocative nature of the Kim regime. Um, you know, his grandfather, his father, and now him as, uh, as the leader of North Korea, and it's a provocation that the world cannot abide. Now we have an opportunity for all civilized people in the world to come together and say this won't stand, but we've got to do it in a unified way, and there's some voices in the past that are sort of playing a double game in my view, other countries that are complicit in this, and we need to make sure that we're speaking with clarity, and I think the best voice right now in the United States is actually the UN ambassador, that is Ambassador Nikki Haley, who is speaking with clarity, and I think she speaks on behalf of the whole nation. Before this, President Trump said that North Korea best not make any threats to the U.S. or they will be met with fire and fury the world has never seen. How do you evaluate President Trump's um, rhetoric and strategy um, to deal with this crisis? Well, I think the rhetoric is significant and it is, he is speaking with clarity. And one of the things that we've seen in the past is sort of hand-wringing and, you know, the U.S. is not sure um, based on some other, you know, previous leadership about how best to respond and sort of always hoping that maybe uh, the, the North Koreans were going to back down and so forth. I think it's very important that we speak with clarity. Ambiguity in a situation like this doesn't lead anywhere good. So the North Korean regime needs to understand that there will be an American reaction to their continued provocation, and they need to build that into a calculus. So it's not as if this is not just going to be tolerated. The United States is not tolerating it, nor will we tolerate it. In terms of strategy, President Trump said all options are on the table, but military experts warn the danger of using military strike against North Korea. What do you think about military options to deal with this crisis? Well, I won't get into detail in terms of the military strategies, but that is to say that's true by definition. That's nobody's first choice on anything. So the military option is always the last option, but it's important that it maintain its readiness. The United States military, which is second to none, and particularly in relationship with our uh, South Korean allies uh, and, and other allies in the region, are prepared and ready to meet out any sort of military challenge. Now, the best approach is a diplomatic approach, and the type of approach that communicates to the Kim regime, you don't have the capacity to, to pull off this provocation. Instead, settle down and move in a different direction. But we gotta, we've got to make sure that we are speaking with clarity and that there is no ambiguity. Speaking of diplomatic solutions, um, Russian President Putin just said that um, it is almost impossible to solve this crisis without um, dialogue, so he's calling for a fresh round of um, talks. Uh, what do you think about this um, approach? And so the idea that we continue these discussions is paramount, but there also has to be um, a sense of clarity that we cannot allow the, the North Korean regime to continue to, to take advantage of the, the timing of talks. I mean, the, the North Korean communists historically have been uh, masters of manipulating timetables and talks and so forth. And we've seen this throughout the world where rogue regimes have said, oh, we're happy to talk to you and we're happy to have all these sorts of discussions, a lot of process. Meanwhile, their nefarious activities continue and they take advantage. So insofar as the talks are designed to drive towards real consensus, that's one thing, but the talks cannot be allowed to simply be a manipulation by the North Korean regime. Everybody is <clears throat> talking about the importance of China in solving this crisis, but also everyone agrees that China has done, not done nearly enough. What do you hope to see coming from China following this latest test? China has a decision to make, because China has a series of unpleasant things upon it. And for right now, China has been a defender of the status quo. China has all, you know, is only too happy to see the, the North Korean regime oppress its people and do all these terrible things because China craves stability on the Korean Peninsula. China doesn't want a unified Korean Peninsula you know, with an American ally right on its borders. China doesn't want a war either, I'm sure. 
and China doesn't want a collapsing North Korean regime because a collapsing regime means one thing, millions of refugees who are gonna, who are gonna flood into China. So China also has the most influence here because China has an incredibly strong and close relationship with North Korea. Said another way, economically, North Korea cannot survive without China. And so China is, needs to make a decision here, and that is to step forward and to take responsibility because the United States is not and cannot allow North Korea continue on this provocative action for the livelihood of the United States. And this is this has now become a threat of great significance, threatening Guam and so forth, threatening our allies in ways that are provocative and incredibly incendiary. And so China's got to make a decision because the notion of just things staying as they are, things aren't going to stay as they are. And so diplomacy is one thing, but the economic power of the Chinese in this case, I think can carry the day, but they've got to make a decision about moving forward. What can the U.S. do to pressure China to take more actions on this? Well, the Chinese have had a lot of influence um, and they've done a lot of business in the United States. And you know, we've welcomed that by and large, but we've gotta be looking now at Chinese banks in particular, the ones that have been, um, you know, over the past, decade have been involved so very, very much in the United States, and we've got to make sure that we're, we're looking at all of our options on the table. Should sanctions be extended to those types of enterprises that are complicit with the North Korean regime? We were successful in driving the Iranians, for example, to the table through a series of sanctions efforts. Sanctions are cumulative, and it's not all one fix. You've got to go after it one way and then go after it another way. And I think it's time for us to, to up the wattage, so to speak, in terms of the sanctions regime and look at those who are being complicit in enabling North Korea to be so provocative to the United States and to, the, to our allies. As the co-chair of Congressional Caucus on Korea, what kind of relationship do you hope to, hope to see U.S. and Korea has? And also, what kind of role do you think the U.S. should play in that region? The United States is a Pacific power, and the region in particular, the relationship between the United States and Korea is one that has gone back decades. And, you know, 60 years now, we're after the Korean War, we're the, the, the world responded to North Korean provocation and um, led by the United States and, and the UN effort there. And Korea is now an incredible success story. Korea went from being a donor or a recipient nation just completely broken and on its knees, and now it's the 10th largest economy in the world. And it, and it has an incredibly strong military, and we need to continue this relationship um, of, of stability in the region. And so, Korea and South Korea in particular and the United States historically have had a strong relationship. That relationship needs to be maintained, not just from a military point of view, but particularly from a trade and a commercial point of view. And to realize in many ways that our fates are joined. And for us to, to, to recognize that this strong alliance is something that, that cannot be overemphasized right now. You are the chairman of the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Tax Policy. Tax reform is very important to U.S. businesses. In the coming months, um, what can we expect coming from the Congress regarding this issue? You're going to see the biggest push that you've ever seen, uh, unless you were around 30 years ago covering these things, but there's going to be the biggest push in a generation to try and update our tax system. Nobody likes the current Internal Revenue Code. People like some elements of it, but nobody likes the whole thing. Nobody really likes the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. And so we've got this opportunity to update our, our tax code, make the United States, again, so competitive and so compelling that, that people want to invest in the United States and try and do everything we can to create real growth in our economy and to simplify a tax code that takes most people's breath away. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that in order to pay your taxes, you have to, you have to buy special software or you have to buy, you know, hire an accountant or, or a tax preparer. Americans should be able to pay their taxes with sort of ease and simplicity, and that's what we're driving for. Is there any message you would like to send to our audience in China and also VOA's worldwide audience? The United States is a country that welcomes to the, the opportunity to interact with other countries around the world. And I represent a constituency outside of Chicago that has people from literally all over the world. And so there's strong diaspora presence of uh, the Chinese American community and a whole host of other nations 
in the region. And we have a strong interest in stability in Asia, stability within the Pacific, and continuing a trade relationship and real shared prosperity. We can do these things. We all have to come together and reason together, and I'm confident that we've got the capacity to do that. Thank you so much, Congressman Roskam, for your time. I really Thank appreciate you. I'm honored to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you.